Welcome to what is a uh, groundbreaking, uh, somewhat of an experiment for the Cambridge Historical Society. Tonight is the first night that we have a program on video which was produced by one of our members and which is more than just a static video. This is a, a video that actually involves movement, zooming in and out, a lot of editing, captions, music you know, basically uh, uh, taking it to a whole nother level than what we have done in the past. Uh, the person behind the camera and doing the editing is Richard Gagne, who's over here, uh, once again behind the camera, where he seems to be very comfortable. Uh, as he approaches retirement, he's discovered that he really likes uh, this sort of work and doing uh, uh, recordings of individuals basically taking oral histories. So it's, it's our gain. Uh, he has made connections with a, uh, I think a, a nonprofit, I'm not sure exactly what it is, that uh, provides us with this equipment, I think, free of charge for the time being at least, uh, state-of-the-art recording equipment. So. We're very excited and very fortunate to have this opportunity to uh, move into the 21st century, really. And we're, we're looking for funds with which we can actually purchase our own equipment and uh, acquire Wi-Fi and uh, be able to upload live, basically live stream our our activities so that folks can participate uh, without having to come here. Because we have a lot of members who are from out of state or who are elderly and just can't really go out at night and deal with driving and that sort of thing. So we're trying to be more inclusive and to uh, increase our ability to, uh, to reach out to folks. Tonight's video is part one of what's actually a three-part video. This is about a 40-minute video and it is um, covering the background of the Morse Mann Mansion, which is over on Maple Street, an incredible building over there. It is uh, some history of Mr. Morse and his family, Morse's Mill, of, of Morse's Mill and local lumbering fame, uh, who did very well, had access to beautiful wood, and built an, an incredible house over there that um, you'll be basically getting a, a tour of this evening. And part two will start with when. Dr. Mann opened up his maternity hospital in 1945. So from 1945 until 1954, Dr. Mann had a hospital uh, primarily for birthing. And uh, there were approximately 1,600 babies born in that hospital over a nine-year period. So you still see almost on a weekly basis in the obituaries somebody that was born in Jeffersonville. And in almost every case, that's somebody that was born in Dr. Mann's hospital. Uh, anyone here born in that hospital? Look at that. So great to see you here. Not looking forward to the obituary. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing the impact that he had. It's been a long time now, but uh, there are a lot of people. I mean, he, he practiced right up until 1991, uh, 51 years, and he practiced out of that hospital, out of that house, um, long after it stopped being a hospital. Uh, I'm thinking that the development, the evolution of Copley and facilities there and in Burlington made it no longer quite as critical to have uh, nearby care and with the improvement of roads and the ability of people to get to other 
uh, facilities. I'm not sure about that. I think we speculate on that a bit in the second segment. So anyway, tonight will be sort of uh, just part of the picture. And then there'll be the hospital and uh, some more about his doctor and career. And the third segment, which will be available online at some future date, probably not the subject of a standalone program, will be more about the Mann family and Dr. Mann's values. Um, personally, I'd like to see that as another program here, but we haven't, that's down the road a piece. And you're going to have to be patient for part two. It looks like it's probably going to be in May, uh, probably on May 10th, if Richard's available. We haven't, this, things are moving fast here. We haven't really had a chance to firm that up. But uh, it's very possible you'll be getting a notice that it's on May 10th, which generally we meet on the second Wednesday of each month for programs. So the the video tonight is going to feature Kristen Wells. Kristen is the youngest child of Dr. Mann. Um, she, like Dr. Mann, grew up in Waterville. Uh, as an adult, she left Vermont for a while to work as a, um, in computer marketing, uh, but returned to Vermont uh, to have a family and raised her family here. So she grew up. Uh, after the hospital closed, but when it was still an active practice, and like many of you here has uh, many memories of going to Dr. Mann's doctor's office for stitches and regular checkups and you know the sort of things that the local doctor does. He was basically the only doctor around in this part of the county, and from uh, 1940, right up until uh, Cambridge Family Practice came in, he was pretty much the the doctor that you went to. So I I may have overstated that. That's outside of the video, but um, a huge a huge presence and very important part of the community. So. I'll uh, speak briefly afterwards, just a pitch for the Historical Society. We'd love to see more members. Uh, we're always looking for folks. We're, we're coming out of COVID. We've been able to be more active. We're doing at least half a dozen programs a year. Uh, I'm, we don't have a, all of our programs scheduled yet for this year, but uh, they're always interesting. It's uh, local history and I, for the most part in its purest form. And uh, you never know what you're gonna get, but it's, uh, you know, love to see you here. We don't always get this many people. Uh, this is perfect. Appreciate you all coming out and uh, hope you enjoy the, the production. Thank you. Imagine, Joel, this is the year 1886, and horses are the principal means of transportation. Uh, the little town of Jeffersonville runs down Main Street over there, just a block away, and all of this is rolling meadows and uh, uh, open land all the way down to the river. Yeah, it was very different then. This would have been a basically a small dirt track big enough for maybe two wagons to pass side by side. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically the first house that was built in this part of Jeffersonville was 
your beautiful house right here, the Morse Man House. Huh? 1886, you would have had a train station over here with a, the Burlington Lamoille train line running about 100 yards back behind the house. And you would have had uh, Depot Street running down. My, in 1886, my great-grandfather and grandfather lived just around the corner in a house uh, along Main Street. Uh, I've been here over 40 years in Jeffersonville, and in just that time, there have been a lot of changes. So what was a beautiful meadow when we first moved here is now the senior citizen right. housing, which is a great use for that meadow, but it's a, a different look and feel for sure. And you can sense that from the house where some of the porches were intended to look out on meadow the open and land. Uh, uh, a very rural landscape, which has since been built up quite a bit. But it's still beautiful, and the trees on this lot are outstanding. No, it's amazing to think that there were no stately maples back when this was first built up. You know, there was nothing here. Uh, one of the things that's really architecturally significant about this home that was built by Morse is that he first attached the, the barn to the house, and it was very new for the time, actually. So the carriage barn, they could access it from inside the house rather than going outside to um, deal with the elements and the harsh winters. So uh, that was something that was unique about this, one of the first houses to have the barn attached. The, the house must have really stood out both for its size, its architectural design, and the photos I've seen show a very landscaped yard with gardens, decorative trees. Uh, again, the whole, the whole setting was quite different than it is now. Now we have traffic here, <laughs> horseless carriages. Well, I have some beautiful photos inside, so if you'd like to come on in, I'd love to give you a tour of the place and tell you a little bit about the history and the background of the owners and really why this is such a special place. So, Kristen, we're here being filmed at your house on Maple Street in Jeffersonville, and for the benefit of those who don't know me, uh, I'm Joel Page. I'm the president of the Cambridge Historical Society. Uh, as I mentioned, I've lived in Jeffersonville for over 40 years, and my family has lived in Cambridge for, mm -hmm. you know, since the late 1700s, and in Waterville, uh -huh. where you live. So right. we have a lot of common connections. I used to work with your father, Dr. Mann, mm -hmm. occasionally when he was a medical examiner and I was state's attorney. Mm -hmm. It was always a pleasure working with him. And. Uh, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Right, well, my name is Kristen Wells, and I uh, live in the town of Waterville now. I had the real privilege of working with my father here. He was the second owner of this home and uh, had his medical offices here for years. So um, Leroy Morse built it in 1886, and then my father uh, was the second owner uh, after him. And uh, it was great to work here with him. Uh, sort and, and uh, organize his books together and so I have a lot to tell you about uh, in in regards to his time here and also the Morse's time as well so please come in and I'll give you a tour and we'll talk about it great right. looking forward to it all right well come on in I welcome you to the Morse man mansion although uh, Morse named this home Finewood and it was because it was covered with vines. I'll show you some pictures of it. You're in the front parlor now of the uh, Morris home. Uh, this was his formal front parlor where he uh, would uh, entertain guests. It was always uh, a formal room, uh, as was the fireplace room here. So the Morses uh, were really very, um, prestigious folks in town. Uh, they were very active in the community, and so they would have had a lot of people come by. Um, when he built his house, actually, he had uh, a beautiful set of prints done. These, this is uh, 
set of blueprints for his home that was done by an architect up in Morrisville, Whitcomb. And it really does um, show you the layout, the original layout of the home and how he purposed the rooms. Um, they were very elegant and the home still really has most of its original features. Uh, there are four stained glass windows here. Uh, there's a lot of Wayne's coating, beautiful bird's eye maple and cherry. Um, all of the woodwork um, was milled in his local sawmills here and uh, the hand carved newel post that goes up the front staircase. Uh, that was uh, just an, another uh, focal point of the home. So he spared no expense in building this and uh, given that he was a very successful lumber magnet in town, he um, really had all of this at his disposal as well. Mm -hmm. So he uh, really built quite an, a fantastic place um, and uh, given that it was the first one here on the street, I'm sure it was very elegant for its time. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the items I found in this building was uh, this, this picture. I found it in the, out in the carriage barn. I'm uh, thinking that it may have been one of Morse's mills. I'm not sure, Joel, and I don't know if you recognize, uh, you know, its position at all, um, but I do have pictures of his two sawmills here. Uh, one up there in the notch, as well as the one in the village, and this may, be, may have been an early picture of one of them. So this is an amazing picture that we have here of the home right after it was first built, and you can see how it was the only home here on Maple Street, although I think it was called Park Street at the time, and uh, there's you know, no trees, and it's the meadow land that we discussed earlier. Uh, I actually have a picture of the Morris children here, uh, they, their names were Pearl and Ira, and this is actually taken on the third floor. It's easily recognizable because the, the uh, wallpaper is still there. So when we go upstairs, you'll be able to see this room as it was originally was um, decorated. I believe that was the children's floor on the third floor uh, in this building. This is a fantastic picture of the house <coughs> around turn of the century. It was a... Uh, an elegant home, as we've already said. The maple trees were planted. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, beautifully landscaped. There were vines all around the front uh, porch here. So they had a lot of privacy and a lot of shade. Uh, they also had an open balcony porch on the second floor. I'll show you that when we go upstairs. Uh, but uh, that, again, was something that would have made it a very unique uh, and beautiful home. I have a number of postcards as well that include this, uh, include this house. Uh, it's, this po postcard is particularly interesting. It's a bird's eye view of Jeffersonville. And what you see here is the house sitting alone on the end of the street. And um, the, uh, let's see, the depot would have been right behind it. Uh, Main Street with the village of Jeffersonville running along here. And some beautiful pictures of the home from different uh, from different vantage points. So Morse uh, was actually, I mentioned, a lumber magnet. He owned two sawmills in town, one up, on, one up on Smuggler's Notch and one down here in the village. And I had heard that there might have been a third, but I'm not familiar with where that would be. Uh, he also had a tub shop and a box factory. <laughs> he owned a farm up near St. Albans and he raised, evidently, Holsteins and prize crops that were known around the state. So he had, uh, he had his hands in a lot of different businesses and uh, was really um, highly respected and, uh, and involved in the community. I want to read you one uh, paragraph from this old paper here that's from the early, <coughs> early 1900s. And it really gives you an idea of how, uh, how involved and how important he was in the community. Uh, there's another picture of one of his sawmills here in this paper. But it says, <coughs> the senior Mr. Morse is regarded as one of the living examples of the success possible to the man of energy in the state of Vermont. A man who has made the most of opportunity in a manner proving beyond any question 
that it is not necessary to leave the state in order to build up an enterprise whose materials of manufacture find a ready sale in all parts of the world. Few men in the state, if indeed another one, has done more to attract attention to Vermont and its possibilities than Mr. Morse. He is also credited with doing his full share to promote the growth and the development of Jeffersonville. So he uh, did a lot for this community. He provided jobs uh, year round, actually, for the residents here. And it was one of the reasons, he was one of the reasons that the town was able to really grow and, and prosper like it did uh, in those early years. And uh, then I ended up coming across a really fantastic picture of the Morse family. Uh, this would have been, of course, after the turn of the century when they had a, uh, is that a Model T? No, I don't believe that's a Model T, but I'm not sure what it is. It's a grand old car to go with a grand home. And uh, the, the driver of the car is Leroy Morse, and he's holding his little grandson. Sitting next to him is uh, his son-in-law, who married his, his daughter Pearl. And then next to Pearl is uh, his wife. And behind uh, the two women is his son Ira. And of course, here they are uh, as youngsters, Pearl and Ira. And then here they are as, uh, as adults. I believe Ira uh, went on to the University of Vermont and then worked with his father here in the mills, um, was a very active as a, as a business partner with him. Uh, and I believe it was 1935 that uh, Mr. Morse was actually in a, a car accident that was a combination uh, logging accident and uh, he lost his life um, during, that, uh, during that time. So, so I've read that when Morse died in the truck accident that the mill was sold shortly afterwards. So it, and then your father purchased the property not long after that. So his death had a cascade effect on, I'm sure, on the economy in Jeffersonville, which uh, being in the 30s was struggling with the depression on top of everything else. So you had the depression his death, the mill closing within a couple of years, right. and then the story basically moves on to your father becoming the owner of this incredible yeah. house. That's right. Uh, it was his daughter, it was Morse's daughter Pearl uh, that sold this home to my father in 1942. And uh, during all those years that he was active here in Jeffersonville and um, you know, such a prominent businessman, uh, really, the, a lot of the same sorts of things were going on in Waterville, just five miles up the road. And uh, that was another very uh, prosperous and uh, bustling community. A lot was going on there. And uh, he really would have been peers with my grandfather, who was Mayor uh, Hubbard Mann. And uh, he had a general store in Waterville. I can show you some pictures of that and uh, how my father grew up uh, during those years. So Joel, I'd like to show you some of the features of uh, this really beautiful home. One of the things here you can see are the uh, hand mill rosettes that he has in the corners of all his doorways and windows. Um, I believe there are three different types in the building and they were, I'm sure, uh, hand milled in his uh, sawmills right here in town. Um, as was the rain wainscoting here, you can see the bird's eye maple and the cherry that run throughout. He has a, had a beautiful fireplace design uh, carved, and this is all original. So it uh, has been in use uh, up into the uh, 1990s. Uh, so it's just a lovely place that stayed functional. And as you can see, he had these beautiful bay windows, both in the turret room, this front room, which was his parlor, and here in the fireplace room. So these were really formal quarters that he had, uh, available for visitors mostly. Uh, his living space was actually upstairs. The dining room is through here. And this was the Morris dining room. It doesn't look much like a dining room now because it was my father's office when he had this building. 
Uh, but you can tell it was an important uh, room in the house because all of the really important rooms had really beautiful stained glass windows in them. And this one uh, actually sw swung open, so it was uh, uh, available for open air as well. Uh, my father actually built a wall here. Uh, he ended up using this space, uh, like I said, as his office, and he had a lot of his important files in his safe back here. But if you look here, you'll be able to see the, pan the butler's pantry that is back here. And so food would be passed from the kitchen into the dining room through the butler's pantry, and this is where the family would have its formal meals. All right, now I'm entering the back parlor, and this is right off of the entryway as well as the, the foyer of the home. But, but this room, again, would have been important. It has another stained glass window. And this is where workmen or uh, people who um, were consulting, perhaps, with the Morses, this is where they would be entertained. This is an outside door. And so anyone who was coming here to do work for uh, Mr. Morris would most likely have been uh, ushered into this back parlor. It wasn't as formal, but then work could be uh, uh, discussed and uh, people would move on with, with their da daily chores. So this was the back parlor. Kristen, what is this little door to your left? So this is a... Uh, closet that is under the staircase, but it's a pass-through from the uh, from the foyer uh, into this room. And I'm not sure if this would have been just storage during the Morse's day. My father actually used it during his tenure here because uh, people would cut through if there was an emergency and uh, someone had come in and needed to be seen immediately, they would check in at the uh, receptionist desks. And then uh, one, of the, uh, one of the assistants there would quickly pass through the back, let my father know that there was an emergency, and they'd be ushered in the back door uh, so that they wouldn't have to come through the waiting room. But uh, it actually ended up having a very, <laughs> very good use during his time. Now we've come into the kitchen uh, of the Morse's home, and I'm sure that they would have had cooks and people here who helped them. And, servants uh, that would work for them. So there was a, a large uh, wood stove here. You can see the pipe still uh, on, the, on the wall where it went through. And they had a very large walk-in pantry where they would have all their canned goods. And this is actually where the butler's pantry was, where it would pass through into the dining room. So the food would be the food would be prepared back here, and the kitchen ran straight into the back. There was a galley kitchen here, and uh, then the food would be brought into the Morses through the butler's pantry. Kristen, I'm noticing a very large radiator here, and radiators in uh, all the other rooms that we've been in. Are these original to the house? I believe that they were were brought in during the Morse's time. They were not brought in during my father's time. So they would have been here early on and he brought plumbing into the home, uh, Mr. Morse did. And actually there's a back staircase right here that now goes to nowhere <laughs> because although it used to be used uh, by the servants to go up and down the stairs in the back part of the house, once plumbing was brought in, they actually used that to run the pipes and things into the second floor. Uh. And is the house presently heated with hot water radiators, or is there a different heating system no. now? You're correct. It's all done by the, the hot water, and uh, it runs all the way up to the third floor. Mm -hmm. There are two really beautiful porches off of this kitchen area as well. This back porch, <coughs> of course, at the time, looked out across these rolling meadows that were here, and then the porch uh, over on the far side uh, went out to the driveway and to the barn and to the uh, horses and carriages. That is a huge porch that must be 75 feet long or so. Yeah, yeah and it was used during my father's time, actually. Um, 
when he had patients here, people would come out here and sit, and it was a beautiful place. It's very, it's very pleasant out here, and uh, people could come out and rest and just enjoy the view. So, Joel, I'd like to show you uh, the carriage barn. This is really still very much similar to the way it was during the Morse's time. So this carriage barn was used to uh, house the Morse's uh, horses and their sleigh and their carriage. And th there are a number of different equipment rooms where uh, they would have been used for tack and harnesses. Let's see, there was a, right here, a grain room behind this door for the animals. The bins are still here. And a storage cabinet here. All beautiful barn wood in this, in this carriage barn. Uh, if you look back here, you have the horse stalls. And there are four of them. This wall was not here during the Morse's time. This was put in by my father as he used it for a different purpose. But if you look back here, the stalls are in really beautiful condition. And uh, they actually have um, a number of different features that were used for caring for the animals. It's still here. And this part of the barn was actually where the, uh, the assembly would have happened for the horses and the carriages that, uh, that Mr. Morse had. These are really large stalls and uh, a lot of the, uh, again, a lot of the old pieces are still here. These are the sleigh bells that were used on the horses. In this room, we still have a lot of the old hinges that were used on the barn. And there was a large door on the front of the barn where uh, they would ent enter and exit, of course. So this was uh, a much nicer way to uh, be assembling all of your uh, equipment than out in the cold winds and the blizzards of Vermont during the winters. So uh, Mr. Morris was really ahead of his time in thinking of that. <laughs> father grew up in Waterville. He was born there. He was the second uh, son of a family of six uh, to Merritt Hulbert Mann and my grandmother was Cornelia Lois Stebbins. Uh, and so they raised their family in Waterville. So my father was born uh, in Waterville on December 8th, 1911. And he was the second son of Merritt Hobart Mann and Cornelia, Cornelia Lois Stebbins. Um, they had a family of six, had an older brother, and then uh, my grandparents had two sets of twins after that. So uh, it was a busy, uh, busy household. Uh, I have a picture here of uh, my father with his older brother, uh, Edward, and then pictures of the two sets of twins, uh, Gwendolyn and Genevieve, uh, Marguerite and Merritt Jr. And uh, interestingly enough, um, except for Merritt Jr., who, who died young, it was a tra uh, family tragedy, uh, that all the other five lived really tremendous lives of service. It's amazing to me that all, um, all of them were um, so committed to serving other people. Uh, at any rate, his uh, father was co-owner of Man in Austin. I have a nice picture of the store here, and uh, it was one of several uh, stores in town. There were three major um, general stores, and there were three hotels, um, as well as uh, sawmills, factories. There was an axe factory, a knife factory, an uh, ore shop. Uh, there were, again, the various sawmills in town. And um, you're talking Waterville. Now, this I'm talking Waterville. Waterville. Wow. This was a real bustling, thriving community uh, during the early 1900s. And um, my father remembered 
um, telling, I remember him telling a story of uh, him being a small boy and the, the logs would be coming down from Montgomery and through, you know, down through the various towns. Um, they'd be pulled on double sleds by four or six horses harnessed together and they'd be pulled in the winter because the logs could be moved so much uh, more easily. And they'd be a story tall with men sitting on top of them. Everyone would run out of their houses in order to watch the sleds go by like it was just a parade of um, logs coming down to Cambridge Junction to then move on. So not only was Morse down here in Jeffersonville doing a big business in, in lumber, but so were many others. They used the uh, north branch of the Lamoille River to, um, uh, as water power for these mills and these factories. I have a picture here of the sawmill in Waterville and it's on the old mill pond up there. Uh, and I think it's also shown in some of these postcards here. Uh, he, this is a picture of man in Austin as it was operational. My grandfather worked with his brother-in-law, Chester Austin, and they have uh, uh, had a thriving business there. Uh, this is a picture of my grandfather uh, at the soda fountain dispensing soda to uh, a little boy. And then there are many bolts of cloth. They were very proud of their store. They said they sold everything from nipples to caskets. <laughs> so it had everything possible uh, in it. Um, I mentioned that um, my, uh, parent, uh, my grandparents um, had a family tragedy. Their, their younger brother, my, bro my father's younger brother, Merritt, um, developed leukemia as a, as a high schooler. And so uh, they didn't have medicines for it in that day. And he passed away at age 16. So that really changed the nature of the family. Um, my father's older brother had already gone away to college, but then my father really wasn't able to um, at the time. So uh, he stayed home. He was very interested in um, fishing, trapping, hunting, a lot of reading. He was an avid um, reader and a, and a good student. And so uh, he didn't go to college right away. As a matter of fact, uh, he was even advised not to go to college because he'd fall behind financially. So uh, he spent that an extra year working. He was uh, doing a lot of trapping. And I actually have some uh, pictures of him uh, with all of his pelts. He had a partner and they would go out um, and trap and sell the hides uh, in order to make money. Uh, he <laughs> the hides in, this pic in these pictures are hanging on their, their canoe. This was a famous canoe in that uh, it was in the flood of 27 and um, his friend Arthur and he were caught up in that and uh, were really lucky to, to get out um, and, uh, and not have any uh, any tragedy come their way. Kristen, you mentioned the uh, family store, Man in Austin in Waterville. Do you know if your father ever worked in the store? He did. He was a delivery boy when he was little. He worked in the store as well. And so he was very active in, uh, they all were actually, they were all active in, uh, deliver in delivering groceries. They would walk many miles. Uh, up the up the roads, um, and people, of course, were living on the sides of mountains and carving out farms uh, around town. And so um, they actually uh, delivered, you know, by walking there. Uh, sometimes they were able to use a horse because it might be of quite a distance. Uh, and <clears throat> I have some postcards here of, of Waterville early on. Um, there is uh, a picture here of where my uh, of, of the town with very few uh, buildings in them. And then you can see Waterville developed and more, more homes being built. Uh, then my, my grandparents' home was built right along Main Street and that was where my father was born. And uh, the roads here were lined by maple maples just like here in, in town. And I have a picture of the schoolhouse, the elementary schoolhouse that my father attended. Um, I actually heard a story about how he shinnied down the drain pipe one day, played hooky from school so he could come down here to Cambridge and watch a baseball game. Mm. <laughs> he, 
He said he got hit for a ruler by a ruler for that one. So I'm not sure he probably did that too many times. But this is right at the corner of Beals Hill and uh, 109. So um, you're familiar with that. Yeah, that's presently the library and the town clerk's office. And uh, of course, it runs right up to the Page family farm uh, right. in Waterville. So uh, this is uh, my, a picture of my father and his family uh, shortly um, after he graduated from high school. And then What he, high school did he attend? Oh, he attended Cambridge High School. And the way he uh, got to school was he either walked here the five miles in the fall and the spring, or he took a sleigh and horses in the winter, and they had places for the horses to, to be kept during school hours, and then they, they'd ride back in the winter months. So uh, there was a lot of walking involved back in the day, and you have to remember um, during those days just how, actually how bad the roads were. Um, they were very difficult to uh, care for in the winter. I have some pictures here of, uh, of how they plowed them uh, around the turn of the century and then during his early years. And they were really just one lane, one and a half lanes possibly. Uh, in the winter, they were, the snow didn't have anywhere to go. And so there weren't these you know, wide roads with um, uh, places to push the snow off. So they just piled the snow high and the banks would just pile higher and higher. Uh, and, uh, and that's how the, they were handled in the winter. In the summer, of course, there were a lot of potholes and uh, a lot of mud in the spring. So it was difficult to get from place to place. Do you know when the Mann family first got an automobile? I do not. I am not sure when they got their first it one. Sounds um, like it wasn't part of their lifestyle, at least up through your father's early school days? That's right, because all through high school, he walked here. So, um, you know, again, let's see, that would have been, he graduated from Cambridge High School in 1929, and, uh, you know, then the Depression would have been hitting, and so I'm sure things were uh, on a pretty tight budget. Um, they still managed to do well, uh, very well during those years, compared to many parts of the country. And I do know um, there were cousins that actually moved back to Vermont from other places because Vermont uh, was able to sustain uh, those years a little better than some other places in the country. So your father graduated from high school right as the Depression hit. That's same right. Same year the Depression hit. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Lucky him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I mentioned that uh, in Waterville there were really, it, it was such a bustling community and there were mineral springs that were located up on Bakersfield uh, Mountain. So what happened is it was a big draw for folks. Uh, people really came to Waterville because of the health benefits that they believed the mineral springs could give them. And therefore, hotels uh, uh, popped up. There was the Mountain Spring Hotel up on the Lapland Road, Bakersfield Mountain Road, and <clears throat> another place uh, further up in town, I believe it was called Dara's, and then there was a, a beautiful hotel. Uh, the name of it was the As You Like It Inn, and it was owned by the Page family for many years. Um, my father's cousins, the Whitings, uh, ran it for the Page family, and uh, it was People came from far and wide. Uh, I have some in interesting guest cards from the As You Like It Inn, and uh, they came from England, uh, other countries, but they came from all over the United States, and uh, we have guest cards here from uh, Maryland and New Jersey, and uh, of course all the New England states where they could get there easily. And, and your father became the owner of the As You Like It Inn, buying it from my grandfather if I understand correctly. That is absolutely true. That was one of his uh, interests and ventures in the, uh, let's see, about the mid-1950s. Uh, I believe it was a patient was actually here in the office and he was attending to him one day and he mentioned to him that uh, 
you heard that the As You Like It Inn was going to be sold and soon. And my father finished working with him and jumped in his car and drove up to see your grandfather and uh, asked him if the rumor he just heard was true. And he said, yes, it was. So my father purchased the inn from him and his, um, his aunt Abby Whiting and his uh, cousin Alice continued to run the inn for a few years for him after that. So uh, the inn was very popular and uh, known all around the state and New England for its fine Sunday dinners. Usually, um, I believe, offering fried chicken and strawberry shortcake. So, <laughs> so it was a very, um, uh, a, a very sought after place. They had a beautiful, uh, they had a beautiful restaurant there called the Sunken Garden. And it was a, let's see here, <clears throat> there was a store next to it that burned down. This was a general store, a, a second general store in town. There were three of them just in the village area. And this general store burned down and they used the foundation of it to, to make a beautiful garden with um, uh, tables and a little restaurant where they served the meals and they had a they covered it with a beautiful um, uh, sort of patio style roof and had a covered walkway from the hotel to the sunken garden and it was um, just a, a beautiful place to, to have, have your Sunday dinner. And that was just up the road from your family's store at the basically at the main intersection in Waterville. That's right. It was right there in the very center of town and there's a beautiful picture here of the, uh, of the town hall and the gazebo and in the very center of town you can actually see the old inn and the, uh, the front of the store that became the sunken garden here uh, in now this the, postcard. The inn was torn down maybe in the last 30 years? It was in, I believe, the late, no, it would have been in the 1970s that that would have been taken down, mm -hmm. pretty sure the early 70s. So I did, uh, I grew up remembering it. It was always, um, you know, just a landmark in town. So my father uh, did finally have an opportunity to, to go to college and he went to Eastern Nazarene College in Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, he was a dual major, math and science, and uh, graduated class of 1934. So he, um, while he was there, a couple of um, very significant things happened to him. The first one was he uh, worked on the College Annual Fund Committee. And there was a young woman there who worked alongside of him named Muriel Schrader. She became my mother. Uh, they they uh, hit it off and uh, were engaged at the end of their college years. Um, the other thing that he did, he worked his way all through college and all through medical school, um, but one of the things he did in college was he ran the college bookstore in order to uh, make money to fund his college uh, tuition. And as, as the head of the bookstore, he worked with Boston suppliers to buy books for the bookstore. And he would then come across, you know, um, he had discounts and he came across some interesting types of books. He became more and more interested in books and that began his lifelong collection of, of you know, finding unique pieces and um, keeping them for himself. So he bought books for the bookstore and then he would on the side buy books for himself and uh, he stored them year after year so that he could start a business in his retirement. And, uh, I think he maybe wishes he had retired a little earlier so he could have done more with this book business um, because he had a lot of books. And I'll tell you about those in a little bit. So those were two very important things that happened to him during his um, college years. And then he took another year off and worked in order to uh, make money to go to medical school. He ended up going to the University of Vermont and uh, was there for four years, graduated in 1939. I have a picture um, as well to show you his graduating class. And uh, then he married my mother. Uh, they waited those years um, until 
he was able to start his practice. And in 1939, they moved to Waterville. So uh, then he began his medical, his own medical career. So we are going to uh, do a little question and answer thing here. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments or memories. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with Kristen. She's amazing. And, uh, you know, learning about more about the family. The Pages and the Mans have had quite a few connections over the years due to our both Waterville and Cambridge connections. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty neat to be able to come back generations later, really, and right. weave this together. And, Liam. So what was made into going to medicine rather than pursuing a career in sciences or going back to retail? I really think my father uh, had always wanted to be a doctor. As a matter of fact, his parents had wanted him to be a dentist, I believe. <laughs> and uh, he, he didn't care for that idea. So he had his um, sights set on medical school and um, really had to, to work to achieve it because yeah. You know, he had to take the time off, but he uh, he made it he made it happen, and he I think he loved serving people and uh, loved doing that through medicine. So, did he ever talk about the effect that the death from leukemia would have had on his view of what he wanted to do? No, I think the only thing I remember him mentioning about that, because um, I know it was very hard on the family, of course, um, but uh, <laughs> all of all of his siblings lived to be over 90 years old. And I remember <clears throat> during one of their 90th birthday parties, uh, him mentioning that if the medicines that had existed then, uh, you, at the time that they were turning 90, had existed back when his um, brother was young and sick, that he too would have lived a long life. So, you know, it just showed what the, <clears throat> you know, the effect of the times, of course, and what medicines were available. Mm -hmm. Yes? How many rooms were actually in the Morse building, in the Morse mansion? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. We talked about it. Um, if I you, should know. If you count, it, so no. there was the mansion when it was Morse's, and then there was the mansion when it was renovated for the hospital and rooms were added in the barn. So it kind of depends when you count. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, but it's, it's got to be up getting I'm, I'm, close to 20 or so. By yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember. And I can get that answer for you uh, be, because I've, I've discussed it before. But Joel is right. When my father uh, renovated the building for his hospital, he added like another six rooms in the back for the various um, more patient rooms as well as uh, his delivery room and um, a surgeon's bathroom um, to, to wash up in. So, um, so there were a number of additional rooms that weren't there during the Morse time. Uh, yeah, but, uh, I, but I can find out the exact information because now you've got me thinking about it. <laughs> I can't remember. Yes? It's kind of a comment. I live on Maple Street, and the house that I own now was at one point owned by Ira Morse. I've heard from hmm. some people hmm. that Leroy had bought it and given it to Ira and his wife, so I don't know what the true version is. And I've noticed similarities between my house and Dr. Mann's house. Mm -hmm. The Morses added my front porch, which is similar, not identical, but similar to that porch. Right. And I was amazed when you showed the pantry and the kitchen cupboards. I have the exact same cupboard oh. <laughs> in my pantry. And I also have a pass-through between the kitchen and the dining room. And what used to be our carriage barn, it's now a small house, 
big apartment mm -hmm. um, attached to the house, and there used to be a door going from what is now our mudroom, kind of like that short door that right. you showed, mm -hmm. with a set of stairs going down into the carriage barn, so you didn't have to go outside in the winter time right. to get into the barn. And mm -hmm. a lot of the woodwork in our house came from Morse Mountain, was Mill, sure. and his mills. My dining room floor is light, dark, light, dark, alternating pattern. Yeah. Similar Another similarity. Mm -hmm. that you showed. It's just amazing the number of things that are different. Now, I'm told that Ira died during the um, 1918 pandemic, but I've seen a picture of him upstairs that gives a different death date, so I'm not sure. But at any event, the story is that he died before they finished renovating the house, which is why a few rooms in our house still have the old cheap pine woodwork painted white, whereas the rest of the house has this gorgeous curly maple, bird's eye maple, and then another wood that I've heard called oh. gum wood in okay. some of the lesser rooms. Huh. It's amazing. Oh, and um, when we were converting our barn, taking down the old ceiling, a bunch of negatives came floating oh. down. Yeah. Yeah. One of them is very similar to that picture you have of the Morse family in the car, uh -huh. and I have been trying for years, because I'm into antique cars, to figure out what that car was, and nobody that I know that I've shown the picture to can tell me. But it's not a Model T, but right? It's not a Model T. <laughs> okay. no, I, the one thing I I'm, would be worth uh, researching is finding out a little bit more about Ira, yeah, because I do think... Too. My understanding was that he did attend the University of Vermont and actually worked alongside of his father for a while mm -hmm. in the mills, which would have meant that he was living into the early 30s. But, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure of that. I think, I think the um, newspaper article that was, sh the, news the old newspaper that was shown in the video uh, had some information about Ira in it. Oh. So it might be worth looking up and seeing. Yeah. yeah. So did you grow up in the house when it was a hospital also? No, our family didn't live um, here in Jeffersonville. Oh, my, yes, my, so my parents' home was in Waterville, and, uh, and this building here was used uh, exclusively for his medical offices mm -hmm. and the hospital. Mm -hmm. So did he just start out as a hospital or just a doctor's office and expand? Because the first time I saw him, I was probably back in 1952 or mm -hmm. three. Yeah, so he actually, so my, my father graduated from medical school in 39, and then he had a two-year internship. Um, and so he was still going back and forth to uh, Burlington for, during that time. And uh, he, this was um, 1940s, the beginning of the war, that there weren't doctors around. And so even though he was still going to school during the day, he was uh, practicing in the evenings in Waterville in his in his parents' home, and so and and it in people's homes because for the most part, you know, you were doing house calls, so so um, so he actually started practicing in 1940, even though he didn't purchase this building until 1942, and then in 1942 he actually opened the medical offices here. It was 1945 that the hospital started. So, uh, so at any rate, he's, he was practicing really from 1940 on. Did, did he continue to provide general medical treatment in addition to the maternity, uh, maternity work? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, did uh, minor surgeries um, there at the, uh, right there at the hospital uh, as well. So he continued on with all kinds of, um, you know, regular appointments and uh, emergencies and deliveries. And probably still house calls. And, and regular house calls all through those years. Yeah, he, uh -huh. he, I mean, he started the hospital so that he could reduce the amount of time he was on the road and the amount of deliveries he's, he was having to do in homes. Yeah. But um, that never stopped exclusively because some people just couldn't get into, the, in, into Jeffersonville and he would have to go to them instead. Yeah. Yes. How did your father commute from Waterville to, to Jeffersonville through the winters and all? Automobiles, I assume, but do you know what kind of automobiles? Oh, my brother would love to answer that question for you. He knew every car that, that my dad had. Um, I'm afraid I don't know, but um, 
but of course he he did have a car and starting in started the, starting at the beginning of his practice. Mm -hmm. Yes. So why did he establish the practice in Jacksonville rather than Waterville? Uh, he was looking for uh, he was actually just looking around the area for a building that he felt would meet his needs. And there was one in the center of Cambridge and one here in the center of Jeffersonville. Those were the two he was deciding on, and he, he chose this one here. It became available, and um, Pearl, Pearl Morris was interested in selling, so Do you it know worked what out. building in Cambridge he was interested in? Yes, it was the one that's very similar. Uh, um, H.N. Gray House. Uh, oh, Prescott's house. The Prescott House, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Do you have any idea how many books he had in his Well, he had tens of thousands of books. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure we have a very accurate count, but I think it was probably on the it was over fifth over fifty thousand. What do you do with them? What did we do with them? Yeah. Is the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are those book sales that we were having. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, we had found a lot of collectors, book collectors, who were interested in his collections, and uh, so we were very fortunate to, to find people who were interested in good homes for them because that was really important to us. Just a comment. My, if you folks in the room think you're old or getting old, <laughs> Dad, Mom and Dad, my father-in-law would advise you that age is but a state of mind. <laughs> he was very famous for saying that, but he started that. <laughs> You're youthful. You might hear a little bit more of that in another one of these segments, so. <laughs> Yeah. I just want to say my dad knew him. He was a couple of years behind him in school over here. Uh -huh. And he lived, we lived five miles on the other side, and dad was a farmer, but he mm -hmm. had a great deal of respect for your dad, for his services for our family, obviously, oh. but, but also just as a man. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. I, he, um, he loved the people he worked with and served, for sure. I remember him telling me one time he, he just, he knew everybody in Jeffersonville. He knew everyone in Jeffersonville. And then um, it's last, in the last year, he was saying, I'm just so amazed. I used to know everyone in town, and now I don't even know everybody on Maple Street. You know, things changed so much. But, um, no, thank you. Jim. I recall your dad coming down to Cambridge Village to the Cambridge Rural School, which is, was where the family practice is now. Uh -huh us our vaccinations. <laughs> <laughs> and then when polio came on, he continued with that. And nice. I remember him saying, get in line now. It's not going to hurt but for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and also, at uh, his retirement up at Lamoe High School, oh, yeah. there, the mm. place was packed with people. And they, they again, said, was anybody, was anybody born in Dr. Mann's hospital? I think two-thirds of the room stood up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Nothing about those that were born at home before the hospital. Was That's home. right. Like you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I, um, Joel mentioned that uh, he delivered. We believe it's recorded roughly sixteen hundred um, babies, uh, and uh, yet I'm you know. I, I'm sure that's pretty close to the number, but I just recently heard a story from um, Amos Tilton in, in Waterville that when my father was um, just just starting out, he was like I just graduated from medical school, and he had come home after a day of work and or a day at uh, at the in Burlington at the Fletcher for his internship, and he had come home at night, and somebody called him up and said, you know that. So and so is having a baby down on Smiley's Corner. That's that's the corner. That's the the sharp corner, mm -hmm. uh, by the Hogback Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, I just barely graduated from medical school. <laughs> <laughs> he said, That's okay. You need to come. So he went down and he uh, that night and he delivered a little baby boy um, there, and that was his first delivery. Uh -huh. And they named the little boy Roger. So uh -huh. that was <laughs> that was a nice beginning to his. Uh, to his career. So how much acreage was 
was with the original building? With the original building, it was the... Um, you said it was all open, there were no housing. Open. Right, all the way over to the mobile station. So the, uh, where Man's Meadow is now was all part of that original parcel. So yeah. route, route 15... Was also part of, of yeah. Bell Gates? Did it go up that far, do you know? It, 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 it didn't include Bell Gates, I don't believe. It, I think it went to Railroad, Railroad Street okay. over to, and like probably down to the river, okay. maybe, because mm -hmm. Route 15 wasn't there. Sure. You had the train tracks going through and the, the, the mill or the McGovern, uh, I, I don't know if it's a mill. Of, yeah. The, yeah. Right. So McGovern's was there. It wasn't all pristine, but. Right. The Morse, the Morse property went all the way down to the river. So that was all rolling meadow land. And then, of course, Route 15 went in. And then what my father purchased from uh, Pearl was the, the, the amount of land that went over to where, through where Man's Meadow is now. Because she said that Ira Morse, her home, I, was that part of that parcel? No, there, by then there, uh, he, he must have sold parcels off down Maple Street, okay. is, is my guess. And, uh, but the land behind those homes was still a part of the parcel that my father originally purchased. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm wondering if anyone else remembers um, when Dr. Mann would give you a shot, he would tweet like a bird. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Can you give us an example of that tweet? <laughs> yeah. By the time by the time he was through whistling, the shot was over, and so then you would look around and you'd realize it was all done. Yeah. He also said to look up in the corner of the room, and yeah. a little dust something up in the corner. Yeah. Little distraction. To yeah. <laughs> You know, a question that I should know the answer to. I've always been intrigued by the 27th flood, and Pappy was a trapper. He nearly ended up in a bad way with that. Yeah. But th does anybody in the room know what the 27th flood did to, like, hit the street? Yeah. Hell, why did the water get? Where? Yeah. Well, anybody know? Remember here. Remember here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, they've got the water line in Cambridge, so you can see how high it went. But I don't know that there is one in Jeffersonville. And, and there's a lot of photos of Main Street, but uh, I've never seen a photo of Maple Street in the flood. Uh, well, you could probably guesstimate from the pictures of Main Street how far the water came. It seems like there would have been water. Yeah, they came uh, up almost to the sweet house down here. So okay. You carried that back. But I don't know if that goes up in a hill. Not much. Didn't they lose the, the double covered bridge during the 27 flood in depth? So the flood, the flood the took the bridge out, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Any other questions? No. Well, stay tuned for the second uh, segment and at least an online version of the third. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get up to Waterville and do a showing of this in Waterville for Waterville folks. Uh, you know, some, there are some Waterville folks here, obviously, but I know there's a lot of interest there. Mm -hmm. yeah, the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for coming, and there are refreshments in the back of the room.